All right. Hello, we are um, here in my studio for Audio Cookbook Live, ACB Live, as I've been kind of referring to it, um, volume five now. So this is the fifth of these little shows that um, I've been doing. And I'm really excited about this time because uh, it's not just one guest this time, it's two guests. We've got Evan Beaumont to my left here, Lucas Melk here, who will be starting off the uh, music tonight on the right. And um, we are doing something quite a bit different than what we've done in the past here, where it's been a little bit more like sort of improvised music. Um, in this case, we're doing we're, do, we're focusing on music made on trackers. Each one of us have um, experience using this tracker called the Dirty Wave M8. Or Mate. Yeah, or Mate. Some people call it the Mate. And Evan is showing it to you right now on camera. And uh, so that thing, that beautiful little handheld tiny device is super powerful. It allows you to do all sorts of, of music production. And, um, but it's, it's a very different approach to making music. Um, everything is, is vertical instead of horizontal like you would imagine with like sheet music. Um, and um, yeah, that's something that I think we'll t maybe talk a little bit about after we each performed for a few minutes to give you an idea of sort of what, what things sound like. But um, that's right, tectonic shift. Yeah, so one of the things though that, we're, that you're going to see as we do this is you're going to see the screen uh, from the tracker. We're going to stream that screen. So that's what we're looking at as we perform this music. And so uh, actually, can Luke, can you switch that real quick and we can show what the M8 looks like? So, so this is uh, an example of one of those screens. And um, so it may be really confusing to look at this and say, well, how is that making music, right? Um, but, um, you know, something that we can maybe explain a little bit if there are questions in the chat or, you know, something that we can um, talk about. Uh, but um, we'll probably switch the screens around and so you'll see a few different screens. But uh, the whole um, number system that is being used is hexadecimal. Uh, not for everything, but for most of the things is hexadecimal, and that saves space on the screen. So the idea is that you, you're, you know, in as little space as possible, you've got as much information as possible, so that you can um, have, you know, the, with this sequencer, you can use up to eight tracks. So this, that's the maximum number of tracks. But in those, within those sequences, you can have samples, um, you can have. Uh, synthesizers that are polyphonic that have many um, layers of sound and so it really gives you the ability to kind of produce music from the ground up so um, it's it's a pretty fun thing and, and we've been um, hanging out as kind of a user group the three of us uh, you know learning this device because it's a pretty steep learning curve but it's a really satisfying learning curve too every little trick and technique and way that we figured out to use this device that maybe it wasn't even in design to to do um, has just been sort of really fun and just kind of leads to you know uh, creativity that you know in a direction that perhaps we didn't take before so um, introduction wise I, I mentioned Evan Beaumont and Lu Lucas Melk here um, MKR sometimes known as um, Anything you want to say about yourself, Lucas, before you start the set off? Uh, I don't have much to say about myself, um, but you know, I've been making music with this tracker and only this tracker for maybe a little over a year now. Um, some of the stuff I'm going to play is, uh, is a little rough around the edges and not necessarily complete, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it and happy to be invited, John, and uh, to share it with anyone who might be watching. Excellent. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, let's let's hear what you got. Yeah, it sounds good. So, like John was saying, this is the uh, you know basically the what I see on the screen of the device, and that's what you'll see while I uh, play this music for you. Thank you. 
one just yet um, so that track I was jumping around a little more and playing different parts um, this one I'll also be doing a little bit of that and manipulating some of the stuff live um, some of the tracks I'll play later are a little more finished so I'll be doing less of that um, but right now I'm gonna go to this one and menu diving a lot there but uh, we can talk about that later I don't know how you're going that fast <laughs> I don't either <laughs> um, yeah which one's next this one? not that one either um, make sure to hit the mic yeah sure <laughs> I, I'm just previewing oh, gotcha, gotcha. This, this one is the one that's next
Nice and done. Okay, cool. Yeah, BBT is saying pew, pew, pew in the chat. Yeah. Um, that's one of the, the things that I love about the M8 tracker is that you can make chip tune with it. Video game music all day on this thing. It's also got um, a lot of other sonic possibilities too, but the chip tune comes easily. So I'm into it. Um, yeah, and then that was the one I just played. Uh, let's do this other one. see some people are liking it in the chat um, I'm happy that I'm able to share this stuff with you guys uh, I got one one more uh, this is the one I've been working on the most lately and uh, I dig it I hope you dig it too
everyone watching. Yes, I am the assassin, BVT. Um, yeah, um, I'd love to, if anyone has any questions, um, we've got to do a little bit of a switch over because Evan Beaumont is going to be playing next, the Evan Beaumont. Um, <laughs> Um, so if you ask questions in the chat, if you're curious at all, you know, we got another computer over there. I can try and answer them there while we do a little switch over. Um, yeah, anything else, John? No, that was fantastic. Okay. Yeah, awesome. uh, yeah I guess I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll plug. Uh, I stream on Twitch sometimes, too, switchboard underscore op. Um, I do some music streams and also game development um, streams. Uh, Betor Up is asking, what software is this? Um, this mm. is a hardware. So what yeah, you're seeing on right, you. yeah. So what you're seeing on screen right now is um, the screen. The interface is what I'm seeing on the screen of a little device that Evan is, is showing right now. It's called the Dirty Wave M8. Um, this isn't sponsored or something, but um, it's a wonderful device. Um, and yeah, so this the software is a type of music production software called a tracker, um, and specifically this one. Um, and after the, after the performances, we are going to talk a little bit about what it's like to make music on a tracker. Um, but yeah, um, we're going to do a little bit of a switch over here. Yep. So, Evan, uh, there before you, you, like, dive in there, why don't you give yourself a little quick introduction? And sure. Uh, I, hi, I'm Evan Beaumont. Um, I uh, used to play music a long time ago, <laughs> and then uh, these two got me into the tracker, and I started making music again. It's been great. Um, yeah, that's about... It's about all I got. Um, I got four tracks, and I hope you like them. Thank you. 
Look on the on the mic here when we're talking. Testing, testing. Check, check. One, two. One, two, better. One, two. I think that's probably a little better, a little hotter. Um, confirm or deny, please, chat. Yes. And uh, go ahead. All right. That was excellent. Thanks. Yeah, nice work. Speak um, the mic before we go again. Oh, yep. All right, here is uh, track two. Enjoy.
Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Um, All right. I got another one that's a little, little different. Yes. Uh, enjoy. This one's a little more obnoxious than that one. Enjoy. Thank you. 
Should I just, can I unplug this or is it going to pop? Uh, it will pop if you unplug it, but we can just, uh, we can just do that. Oh, and then go. no one on Twitch will have to hear the pop. Nice. Sweet. Um, so I think we're going to have a little bit of a longer changeover, maybe. John, yeah, we, how can, much we can do a quick, we'll, we'll do a quick break. Um, okay. We'll, like five minutes or something, and then we're back. Please don't go anywhere. Um, we've got, um, so I'm going to play next. Um, I'm doing something a little bit different where I'm not only just using the M8, but I'm also playing, it's, I'm in my studio, so I obviously have my instruments here, so I'm gonna use the M8 as accompaniment to play along with it with other instruments. So that's coming up in about five minutes, so thank you all for being here. Stick around, we'll be right back. A longer changeover because John's gonna cheat and use other instruments. So. Yeah, <laughs> he's cheating, absolutely cheating. All right, be right back, folks. All right, we are back. Um, so, a uh, little bit of a different screen, so there's, you know, it's like, it looks pretty similar, but 
we can choose different themes on these things. And so um, everyone set theirs up a little bit differently. So I use a larger font to help with my old man eyes seeing the screen here. But um, as I mentioned, I'm going to play with some other instruments along with this. Um, I, I can sequence. I've got like tempo clocking and things like that going on. So, But I think I just like to get started. So um, enjoy. I'm probably not going to stop between things. I'll just play for... 10, 15 minutes, and then, um, and then, like I said, we'll have a brief discussion afterwards too. So, thank you.
Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for being here. Um, and um, special thanks to Evan and, and Lucas for participating in this fifth time of this audio cookbook live experiment that we're doing here on Twitch. So, um, I don't know. What do you all think? I, I, I think it was a great excuse to uh, get out of a little bit of a creative rut and like dust off the M8 and actually put some time into refining and learning some workflows on it a little more. Yeah, you know, absolutely. A little bit of pressure to, to show up for you here, and uh, it was what I needed. 
Yeah, I was I was sweating a little bit, for sure. Mm. Definitely. Excellent. <laughs> trying to, trying to. It's a good thing, right? It's a yeah, good thing. yeah, good. Yeah, it was good. Good sweat. Yeah, good sweat. Good sweat for sure. Um, so we kind of thought about ahead of time. We thought about some questions, you know, that in case there weren't any real questions in the, in the chat, you know, um, there are just some things you might be curious about, but don't exactly know how to ask, but. Um, question we came up with was how does using a tracker right to compose perform produce music as we were doing um, how does that influence your workflow in either a positive way or a negative way um, or any other kind of way right so um, would one of you like to start out on kind of uh, positive it is there in your hand and you can be in a hammock Mm -hmm. or a couch yeah, yeah. And, and like one of the one of the tracks that I played tonight like I wrote on an airplane yeah you know, there's other portable music devices obviously right but uh, so I guess that's more specifically about the M8 that is very portable and very right. accessible right it's, like you said it's always there yeah trackers in general you don't you don't necessarily want to lug your PC computer around but trackers come in all shapes and sizes right yeah. I suppose yeah this particular tracker I should say mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and this particular tracker is based on LSDJ, which was a uh, was cartridge, a cartridge, cartridge for the Game Boy, yeah. right? That um, you know kind of had very similar, a uh, very similar feature set, but same number of buttons. Yep, and but it incredibly expanded upon in the uh, in the for the M8 hardware in in a very significant way. But um, yeah, I think uh, I said I had never touched a tracker before the M8. Really, I think that's a lie. Because I think in when I was like 20 years old, my friend had either LSDJ or Nano Loop or something like that on his Game Boy. Yeah. And I, you know, I made like a, f a phrase or two on that, and then you know, it wasn't mine, so I handed it back to him. But yeah, there was um, an artist. I don't. Do you remember Unicorn Dream Attack, a local artist um, who did uh, work with with Game Boys, Game Boy trackers. A lot of other um, artists in the area have done work with trackers. Um, in fact, you know, Unicorn Dream Attack put out a couple of albums, and he would use two or three of them live, two or three Game Boys with LSD mm -hmm. live wow. um, when they were doing their when they were doing their sets. So but, sorry, um, I kind of jumped in when you were. Do you have anything? No, I mean, I mean, that's all. I mean, I, just having the ability to easily compose. Yeah, you know, I haven't really. It's hard to like sit down and turn everything on and plug everything in. It's, it's yeah. easy to. The thing is so powerful. You can sample. You can. There's three different synthesizers on it. There's eliminate some barriers of. Yeah. So easily yeah. compose. I find that quite the opposite <laughs> is true in trackers for me. Yeah. Um, I think both of you have like much more of a strong like background in being like players of physical instruments and music theory. Like being John especially. Yeah. For sure. um, has some serious chops, but. Um, you know, I uh, you know when I played an instrument, um, it was it was the drums, right? And uh, I I know enough to be dangerous, and I, but I've always made like computer music, um, typically like in a DAW, you know, in Reason or something like that, where it's a lot more accessible, I think, to like actually program the notes um, when they turn off or when they turn on, when they turn off, what sort of modulation or control change over time you're gonna do that. Is a lot easier in you know Ableton Live or something like that. In, sure. on, on a tracker, you, you have to be very intentional about exactly what is going to happen when, on what step, how many ticks, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and still, until you start injecting like randomness into it, but like you still have to have kind of some intention behind the randomness if it's going to sound good. And so that's something that I find challenging or less accessible on trackers. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's there's things you can do to get around that. I suppose you can plug a MIDI keyboard into it. I don't, because um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn workflows just on the device. But um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of menus you have to dive through um, to get to everything, and I'm getting much faster at it and stuff like that. This device paired with you know a small format MIDI controller with like you know four knobs on it or something like yeah, that. I think, I think that opens up the possibilities, especially for, for performance, 
even more so because you can be like you can be writing a filter yeah there's a there's like an that. artist um yeah. goes by um all my friends are synths on youtube all my friends are synths and he uses the image in that way like he'll hook up midi controllers to it to use it um for me i'm always trying to find this balance between you know how much of a performance can i just compose on the fly like how much can i like do without backing tracks i really don't like playing with backing tracks but what's nice about um, for M8 with me is that I kind of use it in a way like you might use Ableton, like where you have, you know, you have rows of, of chains and these chains do different things and, and you can pick and choose so you can kind of arrange, you can improvise the arrangement in a way um, with this kind of a live approach so this so you could use the tracker in a song mode where it just goes through and it will play each row and um, and and that will be a song that's got a beginning and a middle and an end and, and it's the same um, unless you're tweaking stuff like Luke mm -hmm. and Evan were doing but um, you know in the live mode you can decide you know what piece goes with what other piece so if you like the drums from one track and you want it to happen in a different track you can you can do that and you can so you can do it differently every time and that appeals to me because you know I like being able to kind of perform things in a way that it keeps it interesting for me, which means not doing it the same way every time, you yeah. know, um, being able to kind of morph it into something else if, if, if I feel like it. Yeah, live performance is less fun if there's no, like, risk or mm -hmm. risk of um, either failure or of doing something new and exciting yeah. that you weren't expecting, yeah. I think. Um, it's kind of counter to, like, I, I, don't, I don't claim to, like, speak for the tracker community or anything, but I think the way you use it for your performance kind of, is kind of counter to how they're traditionally used or something. You know, like, it, from what I understand, it's, you know, you see videos like tracker songs and stuff like that, it's like, it, you hit play, it's top to bottom, like, the, the whole deal is that it's, like, kind of programmed in computer in a very, like, sequential, very exacting kind of way. I have a um, history of doing that, of using things in the mm. opposite way. Of what they well, and I think, and I think <laughs> it's you know it's a possibility that's opened up on this particular device with that live mode and stuff, mm -hmm. which is great. I, I yeah. used it a, a bit too. Nice. Um, I'm curious, John, do you, because you do use it as an instrument, as one of many instruments, like as an accompaniment, um, do you compose? all of your loops and, and uh, you know, your chains and things like that with that intention? Or do you ever sit down for the M8 and say, I'm gonna, you limit yourself like that? I'm like, I'm gonna write something that is just for this. Well, or you always have the mindset of like, this is a piece of something bigger. I've had both mindsets. And so I've done a little bit of composing on there where, you know, it, it, it will work, behave that way. It'll start, but then, you know, immediately I want to you know, well, how can I work this into a life? That's the thing that just kind of bubbles up to, into my mind is how can I use this in a live setting? What would make this interesting to me um, as a live performance? And so then, you know, so then, so what I've been doing is I've just been, everything I've been doing has been in one live set where, so I just load the one set and all the bits and pieces I need for an entire set of music is there. Um, and I can, I can do it differently whenever I want and there's a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't include out of that set that you know I'll be using a lot of it on the first at a show I'm doing at the Roke Eatery with Eric Carranza and Maddie Harris and um, nice plug, 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 yeah, plug. So, yeah so that, come to that show if, if you want to hear more from the M8 and from the uh, you know the stage piano I'm using and the Osmos synthesizer that we have going on here. I guess I could have switched to the uh, GoPro, couldn't I? Yeah, yeah, we probably should have done that yeah. when we started chatting. Yeah, but, um, you know, so this synthesizer here, this, uh, you may have seen me, like, bending notes. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, so I've been enamored with uh, the Osmos from Expressive E, and I'm, you know, and, and I wanted to use that tonight a little bit, but I'll be using that some more. Um, but you know, just kind of combining the M8 with these other things has been sort of what attracts me to, because it's, you know, if I could bring Ableton Live on a laptop, of course, you know, 
and then you know make sure that there wasn't any other software running that wouldn't crash that there wasn't any you know that um, you know I had the, all the power supply worked out very well and I know that I would be end up looking at that screen and that it would be uh, there would be some inconvenience and some risk there what uh, the the uh, the M8 is is very stable it's only does the thing that it's supposed to do it doesn't let you read its email it doesn't hook up to anything over Wi-Fi so you know the likelihood of it not working the way you want it to yeah there's a chance that you could do something and, and it, it, did, could crash. it did something today tonight on stream that yeah. I have never seen before Which I think you worked really well in your yeah, performance it was it was um, that verb out section well so the verb, the verb was intentional but like when I came back from the global effects it was in a, it was in live mode and it was playing uh, one row, you know, of phrases or, or of chains, and but it was looping within those chains just one of the phrases, and it okay. wasn't at the at the end of like four bars or whatever because that mm -hmm. song is just set up. Each chain is four bars. Each or each got my terminology mixed up now. Each chain is uh, four phrases, so four in, bars. In your piece, it yeah. can be as many phrases as you want. Right. Well, like, yeah. not as many. I think it's well, like, like a max of sixteen. Yeah. But I just used four, nice, nice uh, interval. Mm -hmm. But it was just looping on one of the phrases, hmm. and it wouldn't advance to the next row or hmm. something. So that's pretty I, strange. I had to yeah. roll with it, and that's you know, that's yeah. risk or whatever. Yeah. Doing doing it live. Yeah, but I, I but I think you know, and going back to what Evan said about the portability, like bringing that is a lot easier than bringing like Ableton Live or you know or some other kind of rig that has you know complement backing tracks whatever you want to call it you know but the nice thing about these is that you can do them in a different sequence you can you can manipulate them in real time uh, you can put in generative things it's another aspect that we haven't really talked about is like the, you know all the kind of chance behavior and randomness that you can feed into every single little note can every single note can have behaviors that can be just totally different every time so there's all sorts of uh, generative techniques, which I think are super fun. I think both Evan and Luke used those in their music tonight as well. So, cool. Other comments that you all would like to make? I don't think we're getting any uh, any questions from chat. Just uh, better of saying thanks and that it was great. So. Yeah, we didn't. Nobody had mentioned anything negative. I guess so. For me, the one negative would be it's tedious to make music on that little tiny device on that little uh -huh. tiny screen. It, it takes time, and it's also a very different way. And it, you keep getting faster at it the more you do it, but you know it's not as immediate as sitting in front of an instrument that you know and just playing it. And playing keys is yeah. something that you can't do very easily. Yeah, It's you becoming can. more of an instrument that I'm familiar with, though. Yeah. Um, like, honestly, kind of the way I order my tracks to, tonight when I, when I was playing, was like I picked a few songs where like in this one I learned something new like in, th in this one I figured out how tables work in this one like I was experimenting more with randomness or with um, I don't know with like a random note generation that you that you showed me John like that was featured really heavily in the second track I played I think and then um, you know in the in the last one I feel like I'm trying to work on workflows for like transitions um, I don't know if it's just the way I write music or, or the tracker lends itself to this, but I tend to make like sections that are fairly disconnected from one another and like transitioning from one to the other um, on this thing is challenging because you got to pick every discrete value that's going to change into the other thing. You know, in Ableton, you just like draw some lines um, mm -hmm. yeah. or something like that, but here yeah. you've got to pick every single moment yeah. kind of yeah kind of in a makes, transition it makes you be really explicit about everything mm -hmm. yeah and um which is interesting it kind of lends itself to making sort of precise music in some ways which you know obviously you can hear that in chip tunes and in a lot of like um tracker based music but i mean you can you can program stuff with swing in it mm -hmm. but pretty much always going to have the same swing yeah uh, you know yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to 
you know, get it off the off the grid a little bit. But it can it can be done. And you know, like uh, I, I did I did the thing on that that last track. Um, where just 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 like really fast hi hats, so like right. Hi hats on the 16s or something. You just put it, put a um, you know like a volume LFO on or something with the drunk LFO, pretty high frequency or whatever. Just there's a little bit of like, the velocity of them. Like, it's a human eye. Yeah. Yeah. So like I just since we're talking about randomization, I thought I'd play this little loop that I have here quickly um, because what's happening is. In here, I have a whole bunch of samples that are kind of just randomly being manipulated in, in many different ways. So if I were to, um, you know, look at this stuff, you would see, you know, just kind of like it's playing a single note, but it's basically got all of these these little things here that do different different things. The chance is, chance is more frequent, um, and this isn't even temporal really. It's there's no tempo to it, but it's because these are these samples don't really have rhythm necessarily, and so you can you can get into territory that isn't you know super sequency or super precise, but um, it takes a little trickery and you know some decisions. Cool. I don't know if uh, you can put writing stuff for live performance where it's like a tool going to be reused is slightly different than making like a track for an album or something right. like that and I feel like sometimes when you inject that randomness into it like with the song on the M8 like I'd almost want to re-record off the M8 into if I was going to like actually release some music or something yeah. like that like re-record it into your DAW of choice and when there is that randomness like pick the best permutations sure. yeah you yep. know yeah for sure yeah yeah and that's you know what you're printing something you know it's like that's going to be how it lives for a long time yeah i mean i think it, you have license to make those decisions cool all right well buy yours today how <laughs> much is one of them little things says how much is one of those better little things i think there's 600 bucks you know they went up they went yeah. up in price yeah i think it was like Five hundred. It's one guy, I think, building them, right? Yep. yep. Um, but um, you can build your own. There, yeah. you can. There's a thing called M8 Headless. There's probably some information about it on the Dirty Wave website. All you need is a teensy uh, microcontroller, and well, John's actually built one. I haven't. I just know about it in theory. <laughs> Here it is. Yeah, there you go. So I keep that, it, I keep it inside a cassette case. That little but, device runs. Yeah, it's the just, same software. You can plug it into your computer and get the display. Use your keyboard. Do the same thing. The only difference is you don't have the nice hardware. Yeah. Right. You need a computer or something to for a screen and uh, and controls, right? Um, but um, otherwise, it's all of the same. It's basically the same thing because it's it's running the software um, on, on the, the same TNC, chip on the same t yeah. Same there's chip, there's so one of those chips yeah. inside the the M8 yeah. The and, these, and the headless the, the headless approach to this is very inexpensive um, because those teensies you can get for about thirty five dollars. That's about all you need, and then mm -hmm. and then um, the software is to put on them to, to to the firmware that would go onto the TNC then to make it into a headless M8 is free. And, and there's um, loads of other trackers out there too. I mean, yeah. Uh, better if you ask specifically about this device, and that's yeah. like six hundred dollar boutique yeah. audio hardware, and it's wonderful. Um, yeah. But you don't have to spend six hundred bucks to get into making tracker music if yeah. you're into it. Yeah. In fact, there's plenty of free. Um, tracker applications that just run standalone on a computer. Um, I don't know about been any of them because I've been up for quite some time, time. open source <laughs> stuff. And I, yeah, I'm not going to be able to tell you the names of them right now, but a quick search will um, come up with several. You know, just if you look for, you know, tracker sequencing software, you'll find all sorts of examples that are open source. Good way to kind of get started learning how to, how to um, compose this way, so. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, we're a little over time. We're a lot over time actually, uh, but um, I, you know, we were having so much fun. It was it's hard to 
to end it early. So, uh, but thanks, thanks again for everyone being here. If you get a chance, um, please um, consider donating to the Link MN, a really great organization um, that a friend of mine um, is, works for. So, working to um, end homelessness in suburban areas in the metro yeah, area, absolutely. right? Yeah, help help out with young families, all sorts of really great programs that they have. So, uh, do consider that. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.